Video equipment rental costs paid for by peep code screencasts. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming uh, to learn a little bit about uh, our humble little framework. Um, I hope you'll, uh, you'll find this stuff kind of interesting. Um, before, uh, before I get into the, the details of, of uh, what I'm presenting on, basically the big picture uh, is that WAVES is a framework that attempts to leverage the fact that, that HTTP already defines a sort of a functional protocol. And uh, so the, the idea is that we define resources uh, that implement the basic methods of HTTP, and that's basically what this is about. There's a lot of other aspects of WAVES that um, I'm not going to get into today, but uh, we hopefully uh, this will spur your interest and uh, you'll, you'll be motivated to learn a little bit more about some of the other features. This is also not kind of a tutorial on how to build a WAVES app or, uh, you know, how to do you know, a blog in, in five minutes or any of that sort of thing. It's, it's really about what the, what the point of Waves is. And I get asked a lot, uh, you know, about, you know, well, what, how is Waves different than MERB or, you know, Rails or, you know, any of these other frameworks, Ramaz, Sinatra. <coughs> and this is sort of my attempt to answer. It's very difficult. I found it difficult to answer the question you know, in a 30 second spiel, because to some extent I think Waves is exploratory and we're still trying to figure out even really what it is. And as Matthew King will tell you, who's uh, one of our, our major contributors, uh, you know, I keep breaking all the specs because, you know, we'll get an idea and, uh, you know, re-implement some stuff. So it's not, uh, it's not a framework that's sort of necessarily found itself yet. and. Uh, I think that's very much in the spirit with, uh, uh, you know, of the Ruby community. I think um, Evan Phoenix alluded to it last night that, you know, it's a it's a community of constant change. So we're trying to explore some new areas with Waves, and uh, and you know sometimes we we stub our toe and sometimes we find some neat things out. And I'm going to just try to touch on some of the the coolest stuff that we've been working on, or what I, what I think is <clears throat> some of the coolest stuff. Just real quickly, a little bit of background about myself so you kind of know where I'm coming from. Uh, I, am, uh, I work with yellowpages.com out in Los Angeles. Uh, we do a lot of very cool stuff. We're definitely hiring, so please see me or uh, Kobe Ranquist, who's doing the, uh, the Confreaks uh, stuff, videoing everything here. Um, many of you are familiar already with his work from other conferences. If you're interested, if you're looking for work or you're interested in what we're doing, uh, it's a Ruby shop and, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of fun stuff. So, um, and some of it is, is coming out in this project. So, um, also I've done a number of other things. I've been programming in Ruby for about uh, three years now, um, long time programmer. So. Uh, I've done, I've got some other open source projects I've listed up there to kind of give you a feel for the stuff that I've worked on. So, so that's my background. So some quick facts about Waves, just to give you an idea of where it is in its, in its lifespan. Um, it, the initial release was last February. Uh, we got a lot of uh, uh, very kind of early uh, attention, which was exciting, but also a little difficult because we had to keep, as I said, we kept kind of breaking things as we were learning and figuring out what Waves was about. So, um, you know, that's been kind of a mixed blessing, but it did bring us some contributors. And I want to emphasize that uh, anybody is welcome to participate in what we're doing. It's not a kind of a closed thing. Uh, we're looking for people to, you know, take hold of some of these ideas and, and run with them or help us improve them. Uh, it's not, some of this stuff is not stuff that, that we're 100% sure that we've got figured out. So please, you know, don't be shy about letting us know what you think or ideas that you have for improving what we're doing or how it might be able to benefit other projects. 
Uh, we have a Git repository. Oh, yeah, well, the, I was hoping to announce the 080 release, release today. That didn't happen. We're not quite there yet. Um, uh, Kobe made the joke that uh, we were pioneering another technique called conference-driven programming. <laughs> uh, we, we, so there's a Git repo, Google Groups, and a website, rubywaves.com. Um, hope you'll check those out and jump on the group. We also have an IRC channel. That's all, uh, that information is also all on the website. A quick overview of all the, the various features. Since I'm not going to dive into all these, I thought I'd do a quick and dirty just run through so you can get an idea of some of the things that, uh, that, make, waves, that make waves interesting. Uh, one of the things that we are going to talk about is the resource-oriented nature of waves. And, uh, you know, the thing about uh, resource-oriented is that HTTP is resource-oriented. And I think the whole web community came to this realization a little bit belatedly that, wait a minute, you know, the protocol, there's a protocol there. It's got methods. It's specifically about re modifying and update, re uh, uh, getting resources. And yet we don't have anything really uh, in our you know, model view controller mindset that really reflects the nature of, of HTTP. So there's a bit of an impedance mismatch. And a lot of the frameworks are trying to sort of say, OK, well, just never mind about HTTP. Waves is sort of the other way. And it says, hey, uh, let's embrace the fact that HTTP is there and what it's, what it's about and, and maybe say, hey, you know what, it, 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 maybe it had some good ideas that should actually flow into uh, the way that web frameworks work. As you'll see, uh, there's also a pretty heavy functional programming influence. Uh, we have a, uh, a layered architecture approach, which has explicit support for uh, layers within the context of Ruby modules. Um, a lot of the emphasis is on making the mechanisms that uh, for in, in a lot of frameworks like Rails, for example, uh, that are magical. They're still magical, but they're a little less mysterious and they're more accessible directly. And hopefully you'll see a couple of examples. That's one of sort of the guiding philosophies. Another one is trying to encourage reuse. A good example is applications are encapsulated in modules so that you can have multiple application components in the same uh, uh, server container without them clobbering each other. Uh, we have um, a lot of emphasis on saying Ruby, sort of as we do with HTTP, saying it's already a rich protocol. We put a lot of emphasis on the fact that Ruby is a fantastic language. And the first question we're always asking is, you know, can we do this or can we express this idea naturally in Ruby rather than trying to uh, come up with a configuration file or uh, some other construct that would take us away from Ruby as a language? And again, I think with some of the examples, you maybe will hopefully see that today. Um, a lot of the talk yesterday, uh, Matt's alluded to DSLs and the importance of DSLs. And a lot of the approach that we take is we just say, hey, you know what? Um, Ultimately, we're going to have classes and modules and methods and all the ordinary things, but we may, we may be doing some stuff to generate those or make it easier to code those using a DSL rather than um, you know, making it uh, going away from Ruby and creating some kind of runtime engine. Uh, we have a, uh, a class and module loader that um, is a little more sophisticated than what some of the other frameworks are using. Uh, I was corrected earlier by Yehuda that uh, actually MERB actually has a very similar mechanism. And in fact, they're going in, uh, they're doing some uh, really interesting things with class loading. But for the most part, the class loaders and the frameworks out there uh, are fairly basic and uh, leave a lot of uh, room to be desired in terms of side effects of loading and reloading classes. So if you wanted to have features like hot patching and so on, it's difficult to implement. Uh, Waves is experimenting with some ideas uh, to try to make that workable. Um, and this is not, the last point on here is not something that was really intentional, but if you're interested in kind of alternative frameworks, uh, one of the things it seems like Waves is sort of evolving into is, a, is being a little bit of a meta framework. The way that Rack abstracts the notion of an HTTP request response, Waves layers yet a bunch of other stuff on there uh, for how you match or how you, how you take a request and map it into code, how you deal with configurations and so on. But it's actually kind of architecture agnostic. 
the layered architecture approach allows you to layer in, for example, an MVC architecture or a, uh, uh, you know, a, a very, uh, I'll show you an example later of just a simple uh, application that's just sort of the one file version. So it's, it's application architecture agnostic, but yet it gives you a lot of tools for layering in your own ideas for how a good application architecture should work. So it's kind of evolving into a little bit of a meta framework. Uh, and it's certainly at this state, it's more for the, it's not for the faint of heart as far as, um, you know, if you, if you were trying to use this to just do, um, you know, something, you know, for business purposes that uh, you couldn't afford to have a little bit of, of uh, slack in there for having to rework some things or because, you know, it's evolving rapidly and, um, and again, the mechanisms, they're ma there's some magic in there, but they're little, it's a little more transparent and a little bit more uh, oriented towards the hacker wanting to go in and say, you know what, I don't quite like the way the dispatching works. <clears throat> so the, the bottom line, if I had to pick one thing, and I think about this every day because I get asked this question and I don't have a very good answer and I usually mumble, uh, well, uh, functional programming and HTTP and uh, inheritable configurations, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the reality is that this is one of those things that we started working on because we found it interesting. There's no big, you know, magic purpose or, uh, you know, we're solving this problem that Rails had or something like that. It's, it's really just something that we're enjoying working on. But if I had to pick one thing, if you like functional programming, if you think REST is cool, uh, if, you, if you kind of like the idea of if at all possible, it's something that's just expressed in terms of Ruby's uh, object model, not in terms of a whole other runtime structure or something, then Waves might be something that you want to check out. So into the meat of the presentation. So HTTP, as I have sort of alluded to a couple times, if you think about it, what is it? It's a protocol that defines a set of methods on resources for the basic CRUD operations that we see all the time in just about every application in one form or another. Uh, so, you know, it's funny because once you really look at that, it looks suspiciously like something that you would want to implement in Ruby, right? So in this particular, this is not waves, by the way, but this is sort of like, you know, if you were thinking this through, your first thought might be, okay, uh, I'll have a resource object that takes a, a request uh, and then uh, the different methods that can be invoked by HTTP uh, with a request that, and then each of those methods would then return the response and, and so on, right? Now this is a little bit of a naive example, but the gist of it is, hey, you know, it's a protocol that defines methods on resources, so let's implement that. Uh, and if you go a little deeper, uh, you can even think about the various components of a request as a method signature. You have a content type, the type of the, the data that's in the request. You have an ID, okay, I'm modifying or requesting this particular object. Uh, you have an accept thing that says, look, uh, this method returns these values or, or a value of this type. Uh, you have a query string, which is sort of like, you know, keyword arguments, right? <clears throat> so you could sort of say, okay, well, I'm going to define uh, methods with these signatures. Again, uh, it's not quite that simple, but conceptually that's where we're going. The problem, of course, is that what you end up doing, in, in Ruby at least, is it starts looking like this. And in a lot of frameworks in one form or another uh, basically boil down to something like this. Uh, they have some, some pieces that allow us to pull things out of the the route or uh, specify, um, um, you know, a, uh, you know, the, the type of the accept response or something like this. But uh, we end up sort of with the equivalent of sort of a big case statement and, uh, you know, within, it, trying to do that within each method is, you know, even worse in a sense. So, uh, we, we don't want to do this because it's basically, it's kind of unmaintainable and, it'll, and it leads to a lot of redundant code. Which brings me to Functor. So Functor uh, is a piece of code that I actually wrote a few months ago. And this gives you an idea of sort of how much Waves is evolving because Waves is now completely based on Functor. 
whereas uh, I only wrote it a few months ago and the framework is like, you know, nine, seven months old now. So, uh, you know, it, it's, we've really rethought things once Functor came into the picture. And what Functor does is it introduces pattern-based uh, argument or uh, pattern-based argument matching. It's not a very eloquent way to put it, but uh, I, can, I can do pattern matching on the arguments to determine which block of code or which method I want to invoke. So I'm going to dive into a really quick little segue here just to give you an idea of how Functor works. Uh, so here's a simple example. This is the canonical functional programming example uh, where I implement the Fibonacci sequence and I have Actually, you know, I sort of define 0 and 1 to return 1, and then I define uh, the actual meat of the thing to match on integer. So, and then if I call it, you know, I get, I'm not even sure that's actually, I think that's the wrong answer. <coughs> well, cut and paste mistake. So, this, you know, just I'll leave that there for a second just so you can get the gist of what Functor is doing. If you've worked with Haskell or other functional programming languages, this, this example is well known in its sort of second nature. But for those of you unfamiliar with it, you know, it's, it could be a little tricky to uh, grasp the, <coughs> the idea here. But basically what I'm doing is I'm, I'm dispatching my methods not just based on the method name, but also the arguments. And this can match on types, regular expressions, uh, and even lambdas. Here's an example where, all oh, right. Uh, so Waves is uh, a, one of the primary offenders of uh, Evan Phoenix's directive not to use base. Um, we do that everywhere. So I was kind of cringing while he was while he was doing, while he was giving that part of the talk. And every time he would go to a new meme, I would think, uh-oh, you know, is this one also going to be one that we fell for? <laughs> uh, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't really do a whole lot. I thought he might go off on a whole functional programming rant and completely uh, make me want to not do this presentation, but fortunately. <laughs> anyway, uh, so here we have a case where we've got the pattern matching on regular expressions. Um, so this is a little better, but we're still probably not quite where we want to be. This also illustrates putting a functor in a class. So uh, this is a little different than the sort of functor new given, given, given approach. It's conceptually the same though, it's just that I mix in some features into my class that uh, allow me to treat functors as, as more or less ordinary methods, although when you see the stack trace you you probably wouldn't agree. <coughs> uh, but they are actually Ruby methods. It's just the stack trace sort of becomes a black hole. And we're still working on that. Um, unfortunately, we're still not there because um, the method signature isn't just the URL. It's actually quite a complicated thing that we're trying to match against. And if you think of it again in terms of that method signature with a response type, you know, the, the, which is the accept header, content type, query parameters. I mean, there's a lot of stuff to actually match on. So we need a more sophisticated approach. Fortunately, Functor uh, allows you to use lambdas to match against things. So, uh, you know, when I was first kind of toying around, this was sort of the, okay, I've got it now. I'll just define uh, lambdas for everything, and it'll work great. Now, as you can see, I mean, I'm actually showing this here. Uh, you know, okay, I'm going to match, I'm going to define a lambda that matches on the path and also matches the request header. The problem is uh, that, and then I've got the functor where I use the lambda here. The problem is, is this is actually even messier than what we had before, although it's a little more functional. Uh, what I quickly realized uh, is that if you actually want to do lambdas for all of this stuff, uh, you need a DSL that will actually create them for you conveniently. And uh, so that's sort of where we moved with the whole thing. So that's what Waves is trying to do for you. And since this is a largely male conference, I figured it wouldn't uh, hurt too much to put up a gratuitous picture of a girl in a bikini. <laughs> <coughs> so we have uh, the basic principle. What Waves is really trying to do with you is it 
It says, I'm going to give you a DSL that's going to allow you to define methods using these complex patterns on your resource classes. I'm going to allow you, and this goes back to the idea of the modularity, I'm going to allow you to mount the resources, much like we mount file systems with NFS. I'm going to allow you to mount a resource um, and so that, so that I can uh, have you know, multiple resources and, and the, the, there's some pattern matching there. So there's, if you think about it, the, the request comes in, Waves says, okay, let me look at your mouse, let me figure out which request is the, is the one I need to be, or which resource is the one I'm interested in, and, uh, and then I'm going to call the, the request method on that resource. And uh, lastly, there's uh, to actually do something once you're inside the, the functor method, the request functor, get, put, post, delete. Uh, we have the layered architecture stuff, which layers in, for example, MVC and so on. So, all right, I don't know how easy this is to read, but um, this, is a, this is just to give you an idea of, of waves and some of the flexibility. Can people read that okay? Okay, all right. Um, so this is sort of the one file version of the application. It's not quite as simple as Sinatra, um, but um, the, it's also, we can also go and do much more complex things potentially. Uh, so here's an example of the use of a layered architecture construct. So I'm including a foundation which is just a set of layers that gives you sort of a basic application shell. So I, since I'm not doing much, I'm going to include the simplest possible foundation. I've got uh, my configuration, Waves configurations are inheritable. You can see I'm inheriting from a default configuration, but I could have sort of a, a main configuration that I use for different deployments like test, production, staging, whatever, uh, and then inherit, you know, 90% of the configuration and only have to actually configure, you know, what's left over. Um, it uses Rack, as you can see right here, it's creating a, uh, a little Rack app right there and then using, a, and again, you, the dispatcher is pluggable, so you can actually plug in your own dispatcher code if you have the, the heart for it. Um, and then here's where we get into the actual resource stuff. So let me highlight the two or three lines here that are relevant. So first I'm mounting, now in this case, since there's only one resource, it's, there's no conditions associated with it. It basically says uh, mount that resource no matter what. I, that's the only one I've got. You can use that as a default, like if I had uh, seven or eight mounts, I might say, you know, at the end, okay, here's the one. If everything else fails, go to this resource. <clears throat> then I'm defining a resource class, hello, and that implicitly references uh, this hello because they're in the same uh, application module called Boogie Board. <coughs> <clears throat> then I'm defining, a, uh, these, this is the DSL, I'm defining, this is going to actually define a, a method, an actual Ruby method called get that will match on, on the root pattern and then pull uh, the, 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 the name query parameter. So that's not a very complicated pattern. We could have probably implemented that a lot easier some other way. But this gives you the, the basic structure of how Wave Apps works kind of in a nutshell. All right, so since I just showed you a really simple example, let me go through some more interesting examples. Again, if you've seen Erlang, uh, has a, a, a framework that kind of has a similar flavor on the pattern matching, but there's a few twists here that I'm not even sure are in the Erlang version. But basically we have the, the path is an array. Strings are literal things to match. Symbols are parameters we're going to extract. So syntactically it actually looks a little bit like a Rails route. Um, but it's just broken into these array elements. And part of the reason for it is I can do things like create, you know, uh, more complex uh, uh, things to match against if I want. So just taking us quickly through these, the first one's just going to match the literal path admin, nothing else. The second one will extract whatever it is that the first path component is into the name parameter. Uh, and then, and then uh, the second parameter will have to match the literal edit. The next pattern says, uh, if there is a parameter, um, extract it into name, otherwise default it to the value of home. So that's a default value in that case. Um, this one uh, basically says, okay, 
blog and then the name of the blog, extract that into the query param, but only accept uh, an, R an RSS um, accept header. So only match if the accept header specifies RSS. <coughs> uh, continuing on, true works as a wildcard. So if I have true in the middle of my path components at that point, that will match anything. Um, I can uh, say, I can, if I, do, uh, actually it will match the whole rest of the path, not anything. Uh, path will match uh, anything and extract it into the path parameter. Um, here we have one that matches on query strings where basically I'm saying uh, I, want a, I want a path called location, but it should also have Latin long parameters, otherwise don't, don't match. <clears throat> There's a lot more that I'm not going into, but this gives you an idea, I hope, of uh, how the DSL works. So this will go in and it will create a whole set of constraint uh, uh, lambdas that are passed into the functor method, the get, put, post, delete on the resource. Is everybody still with me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's funny that you mentioned that. I, I don't have it on the roadmap slide, but one of the things that I'm kind of looking forward to do, there's, there's some real interesting similarities between Rinda as a pro, or Linda as a protocol and HTTP and, and how you might be able to map those. Any other questions before I... So let me just, this is from a real app, and again, if uh, hopefully that's readable. It's a little bit, maybe a little smaller font even than before, but um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but if you kind of just look at this, you can kind of see, uh, you can get a feel for um, uh, some examples of, you know, I'm uh, defining a, a post method, matches on name. The way we get named routes where I can actually call and generate the path later is, is with this syntax. So this is a post, but I'm naming it update so that I can then later call up paths update on that resource and generate that path to link to it. Um, some other highlights. You can see we've layered in the MVC layer here. So we get some helper methods that give us the controller that corresponds to that resource name, also the view. So uh, I won't go into a lot of detail on how the MVC layer works, but um, uh, you can see that there's some helper methods in there. And uh, one other thing that's probably a little confusing is these widths. Uh, there's been some debate as to whether or not that's really the right idea. But if you think of mounts as being able to have labels, uh, sort of a scope uh, parameter that I can define around, OK, I mounted with these, these criteria. So over here in the resource, I only want to match uh, on the mounts that were uh, that were that were matched with those criteria. So that that sort of encapsulates the notion of um, you know this is what I this is what I already know is true about this request. So I could have in the mount, for example, uh, accepts RSS, and now I if I have a with statement around my my ons here then I know that, um, that uh, I'm in an RSS feed. So I might have one called feed, for example. This one is oriented around the perspective. So in this case, if the mount matched the admin path, uh, however that's defined in the, in the mounts, then I know I'm in, I'm in author mode. I, I've got somebody coming in through my administrative interface. Uh, another thing you see is sort of the equivalent of uh, filters. They're just methods. You have a bunch of these besides put, uh, get, put, post, and delete. You have uh, before and after, which will be run by the dispatcher before and after the request is, the main method is run. Uh, there's always, which is going to get run even if there's an exception. Handler, so you can define handlers. Again, it matches on the exception type using functor, so you can say, okay, you know, I want to handle these types of exceptions and so on. So, there's quite a bit here that I'm just kind of touching on, but uh, hopefully that gives uh, everybody a kind of a flavor of in the real world how this starts to look. Everybody, everybody still with me? The cool thing, though, is at the end of the day, and this is sort of my proof that, okay, the DSL isn't doing anything too dramatic, 
Uh, it's really just defining methods on Ruby, and you can see that by actually just calling. Here I'm just doing a union of the instance methods with the, the main HTTP protocol methods, and you can see those methods are in fact uh, in, defined on that resource. So they're real Ruby methods, uh, um, and uh, it's a real class. It's just an ordinary class with methods on it. The methods just happen to implement some really crazy pattern matching. So that's so. If you're with me so far, you're kind of thinking, okay, you know, that's an interesting model. But what what is what is the benefit of doing it that way? Why would I? You know, why is that better maybe than doing things? The way, say, uh, you know, um, normal, you know, route-oriented frameworks are doing it. Um, some of the benefits I've kind of outlined here. One is since they're normal classes, I can actually inherit routes. The uh, method functors are inheritable, so you can actually override a base class's implementation, for example, of a particular functor, or um, uh, or just pick up, you know, a bunch of functionality from a base class. So if I want to have, uh, if I know I have a lot of kind of common features shared by a bunch of resources, uh, I want to create some sort of default code. Uh, a good example was in the thing this morning when the, with the um, uh, make RESTful um, helper, right, the, the DSL for saying, okay, I'm going to generate a bunch of methods for a, rest, a RESTful controller. Uh, this is kind of a similar thing in that, you know, at the end of the day, I might have a base class that has all that implemented, and then I can just override specific things in my derived classes. Um, I can use relative paths because the mounts can actually say, okay, here's the path prefix. That makes it a lot easier for me to reuse uh, resources in other applications where I might have a slightly different convention. So I could, for example, take the blog apps resources, entry and comment and so on, and mount them on any URL that starts with blog. And that could coexist with my wiki application where I mount all the, all the resources using the prefix wiki. Um, and the last thing, which can be a drawback if you're, if, or a, an advantage if, depending on how you think about it, you know, is, is the modularity that you get with this. If, if you have a uh, a lot of, it's not a big deal if you only have a small number of routes, but if you start to get into more complex applications and then you've got uh, 30 and 40 routes going, I mean, it starts to become kind of a headache to, to manage all that. There's ways, to, I mean, you can certainly break them up yourself, but it's, this is sort of supported and encouraged, almost enforced, I would say, by the framework to some extent to say, you know what, divide up your the way that you do the request handling, the same way you do anything else. You know, break it into chunks, separation of concerns, and so on. Uh, I can, uh, let's see, uh, the mount points, um, reuse I've talked about. Performance is an interesting question. Uh, Functor is, at this point, and probably will never be super speedy, but um, the, because it's doing all this pattern matching. Although you have to do some kind of pattern matching to process a request anyway. Um, but one of the things that uh, happens that speeds this up a little bit is because I'm d using mounts and I've got the resources broken up into these chunks, I'm actually only looking at how, you know, I go through all my, you know, or up until I find one, I go through my mount uh, conditions, the patterns that I can match on for that. And uh, once I find one, then I only have to look at the patterns that that resource is trying to match on. So I don't have to end up going through, if I have 25 routes, I don't have to go through the whole routes file and, and uh, you know, in the worst case, I only need to go through, you know, worst case, 10 of them to find a match. If, if I'm if given this model where I have five resources with five different uh, methods that are implemented. Uh, here's just an example to make the mount point concept a little bit more concrete. Uh, uh, again, this is from the CMS app that we're building in Pages. That's sort of the, you know, the app that it, Waves was extracted from originally, if you will. So it's become a nice little test bed. But I'm, I'm mounting a d bunch of different resources. These I'm mounting just based on the accept header, or the accept header. So if I, you know, I, I'm saying, look, I want all images. I don't care, 
you know, uh, about anything else. If it's an image, if the browser's asking for an image, send it over to my image resource class. Similarly with, you know, CSS and JavaScript, if it's an RSS feed, send it to the blog class. Uh, now this one's a little interesting because this is a wild card and what it's doing is it's saying pull that out from the path. So I'm saying, okay, the resource is going to be embedded in the path, so pull that out and I'm going to use that to determine the resource class I want to use. <coughs> Um, and this is a good example of how we set up a, a label for a mount. So now I have scope in my resource so I can say, well, I don't want just, uh, you know, any, anything, any mount point. I want specifically only uh, the case where I'm, I'm uh, matching the admin path. How, how are we doing on time? Does anybody have the time? Yeah, about 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay. Um, so I talked a little bit about foundations and layers real quickly, just a conceptual idea of, of what Waves is trying to accomplish here. So we've talked a lot about this piece. The resource uh, allows you to essentially encapsulate, uh, you know, say, okay, I want for this HTTP request, I want to do this thing. But that thing is going to depend on your application architecture. Waves is agnostic about the architecture. And it does this through a layered approach. So, you know, I have a foundation, which is enough to basically, that's some, some set of layers that guarantees you, hey, this will run as a Waves app. It's not going to suddenly, you know, oh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, you know, how to, uh, um, you know, I don't know how to find this file, right? You know, I don't know how to load a, a, you know, a class or something. And then you can add additional pieces onto that. Um, so just a quick example of the default foundation to give you an idea of how this works. And this is definitely an area where it's still evolving and I'd love to have people working on, kind of jumping in and working on and saying, okay, you know, we're going to build out a, uh, <coughs> there you go. we're going to build out a, uh, a, a you know, a, um, a, a layer to do uh, service-oriented architecture or we're going to build out a layer that focused around rich internet apps. This is kind of one of the core driving things is this belief that, hey, some of these things are a little different. You know, they're not all sort of MVC. They don't fit that pattern. Uh, and we end up sort of retrofitting stuff into M MVC where we, or where we, you know, if like if you have MVC implemented in the browser, there's now a JavaScript MVC. It's actually several of these that do JavaScript MVC-like stuff. And then I've got MVC on the server you know, I'm, it's kind of redundant, so how do I get around that? Well, maybe I need a different approach. And again, I'd, it would be great if we had people kind of helping us out and building out some of these additional uh, layers. Uh, in this case, you can see, you know, we're, we're adding the inflection, we're adding uh, sort of a really basic, simple layer, then adding MVC in on top of it, and then some error handling. Uh, but that's, you know, just the tip of the iceberg of what you could do. Um, so there's a lot of places in the Waves code with that comment right now. So there's still ways to go and uh, um, a quick and not in any particular order, although I did sort of try to prioritize this. Um, you know, the documentation's a little behind where this presentation is at. So if you, we used to have a really nice tutorial and, um, you know, some, some nice, uh, the R docs were reasonably solid and so on. but. Uh, they're all a little out of date at this point, so uh, you know that's something where you know you want to jump. If you want to get involved now, you probably need to get on IRC with us or on the Google groups. In another couple of weeks, I think the documentation will be caught back up. Again, it's the conference-driven development syndrome. Uh, some of the other things I won't go through this whole list, but uh, basically, you know, we're trying to. Uh, uh, kind of round out a lot of the things. There's a few places where the features are missing or uh, the, the different sample amps, apps aren't really demonstrating properly how this resource-oriented approach goes. There's some cool gems that we want to be able to leverage and integrate. Uh, Matthew's implemented a really cool thing. Is it called, is the official name now Cassandra? Not yet. It's still at uh, Oh, okay. Casuistry, yeah. And so Cassandra was... <laughs> A, be, a, a little easier. Yeah. It's got to be one of the most whimsical IRC channels. You should jump on just because uh, 
John, what's his name? John Paul Twanger. Uh, he's a very witty guy and is constantly, you know, punning. I mean, he's just there, I think, sometimes just to provide some levity while we're sitting there going, oh, God, the fuck, dirt. And then he just comes on with some goofy joke. And, um, Did you tell him what Cassandra is? No, I didn't. I, I got distracted. So it's a uh, sort of Markaby, but for CSS. There's a couple of these out here, but, but Matthews is, I think, uh, taking it to the next level. We'd like to integrate that into the way that views work. Erector has a nice, one of the things that was very big in Waves early on is the views are actually classes. You can inherit views, but we didn't really do anything with it because we just dumped you out into Markaby templates or, or whatever templates you wanted. Uh, but uh, Erector has a nice implementation that's sort of like Markaby, but is class-based, and we're probably going to make that sort of the default mode to leverage the fact that in Waves, you know, views are just classes, and just like any, again, it's, it's just Ruby. We're just trying to use classes, objects, methods, just like you would in anything. Uh, again, I can't emphasize enough that uh, We'd love to have more people involved. I think it's a good time. I think we're starting to get our feet as to you know what the, uh, I'm, I'm really determined to stop breaking all of the specs. So it would be awesome to have people, again, working on different aspects of this. Uh, we'd love to have you involved or at least have even your ideas and feedback um, if this approach is interesting or intriguing. So any questions before? <coughs> Um, there isn't anything in waves per se, no. I mean, um, so there's not like a resource repository. You'd have to sort of know, um, you know, looking at uh, the, the different apps that were loaded. You can get a list of apps basically <laughs> from waves. You can say, give me all of the application modules that are loaded. And then from there, you could say, OK, presuming they all follow the same naming convention of having resources as the submodule containing all the resources, you could do it that way. But there's no, there's no like formal or first class mechanism for that. Yes? You emphasize pattern matching so much at the beginning. Why didn't you just use Erlang to start off? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just love Ruby. I, I'm trying, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm a little bit guilty of trying to turn Ruby into Erlang, but uh, um, there's a lot of stuff about Erlang that I just find kind of ugly. I love the syntax and simplicity of, of Ruby. And so I'm, you know, we're trying to kind of cherry pick a few good ideas and then, and then make, see if we can make them workable in Ruby rather than saying, you know what, let's scrap all the great things about Ruby and, and do it in something like Erlang. Any other questions? So, how do you plan on running uh, shared resources? You know, so, if you want to share a resource from one application to another, a, how are you going to plan on bundling the, the resource itself? And then, secondly, you know, a resource is more than just a controller code or model, right? There is, especially for web application, the JavaScript artifact, there is uh, styling concerns, things like that. So, how are you going to plan on sharing? You should become a, a contributor. That's that's the answer I have. I, the answer is layers. Well, you can put you can put anything you want in a layer and slide it into the stack. That's what I. Yes. Do. Yes. I mean. Slide a layer that that like for instance the uh, sorry to take over. No, go ahead. The uh, ORM that you use is dependent on the layer uh, in your application. You declare I want to include. Waves layers ORM SQL or Waves layers ORM. And what is the layer? Is it? Uh, it's a it's a module that includes itself in your application, and it, there's, there's basically some little trickery it does, and it adds. It's like a plugin, but it uh, but we, we think of it more as like just a stack of things. Yeah, you use it, it's a normal module except it overrides included and goes in and fiddles with your app. Basically, that's what it does. Now, that's why I was making a distinction because the layers are really intended to layer functionality into the overall framework. Although you could use them that way, 
And probably what we will have is a mechanism like layers for doing what you're talking about, where I can, I can bundle in a bunch of pieces. Uh, you know, but what we're trying to do is, is do it just as, say, a gem, as opposed to having you know, a gem with maybe some, a module that overrides included or something that's very Ruby-esque. And, and so I'm not, I, I can't say that we've thought out things like how you would bring the assets with you. Um, that's kind of an open problem at this point. I think it's a very, it's a very, right now we're at the stage of trying to make that possible or realistic to even think about bringing in an entire application and having it coexist with another application without all these collisions on what are, what's the route supposed to be, uh, you know, what about the name spacing and all this kind of stuff. But we're not at the stage of, okay, we've solved that problem, so now let's move on to making it nice and neat to package uh, an entire app. Anything else? I think we're probably close to time. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your attention. Video equipment rental costs paid for by Peepcode Screencasts.